Hello and welcome to my channel. I've been really reflective lately. I cannot believe that I've been in Dallas, Texas a little more than 25 years. And I guess that's because like I never saw myself moving away from Kansas City, but my job was eliminated and I was sent to interview in Dallas for my exact same role. And it seemed like all the pieces were coming together. Like it was really bad to lose a job, but at the same time, it seemed perfect that my same job was open in Dallas. And at the same time, it was the scariest decision that I have ever had to make because it meant moving away from my community, my support system, everything that was familiar. And here I was trying to make this decision about moving to Dallas. I was really in between fear and anticipation. I had one uncle and aunt here, but otherwise I knew a few people from church, but it was a really big decision. But I found myself in the middle of all of it, having to step back, to pray, sort through it all, seek God for his guidance, and really find a place of clarity and peace concerning this decision. And I also reached out to friends and mentors and I asked for their prayers and I asked for their advice. But through prayer, reflection, and really these conversations, I got to a place where I felt a sense of calm that really helped me make a decision that I could stand behind. And what I learned is that it is really important to seek God's guidance when we have these moments of uncertainty. In this week's lesson, we are going to be really exploring how we can find that guidance and how we can find peace in our own decision-making processes, just like I did in that pivotal moment of making the move in my life. And we're gonna explore really practical ways to seek that divine guidance and maintain our faith through challenges. I want you to grab everything that you need to study, your Bibles, your pens, your handy dandy notebooks, Look, it's time for us to get into this lesson. Hello to every one of you. Hello, TSSG family. Hello, TSSG family. You're in the TSSG space. Well, hello, TSSG family. Sunday, 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 my name is Waynell. You're in the TSSG space. And here I share Christian content that's largely inspired by and or based on our Sunday school lessons. I do serve the international and Church of God in Christ lessons only. And I am thrilled to be your reviewer for this week's lesson entitled Solomon Dedicates the Temple. It is my absolute joy to share space with you all every single week. It has been nine and a half years that God has blessed me to do digital evangelism in this way. And I love this space. I love the people connected to it. I get the most amazing messages each week. And you all encourage me so very much in the work that we do here. So I want to say thank you for allowing me to serve you. If you're a newbie here, I want to say welcome to you. You've just joined an amazing community of people. We are pastor, superintendent. Christian ed leaders, teachers, students who all love the word of God. And yes, I even have a few friends who are not quite Sunday schoolers yet, but they are looking for amazing Bible studies. So if that's you, you have found your tribe. I need everyone to do me a favor. Please do me a favor and look down below and make sure that you are subscribed to this channel. Click the button that says subscribe to get you connected and then take the extra step of clicking that notifications bell so that you don't miss any of the content when it is released on this channel. We're doing so many amazing things and I'm excited about it. The last thing that you can do is please be sure to click that thumbs up like button. It doesn't cost you a thing to do that, but it's certainly an encouragement to me and it helps YouTube to know the kind of content that you enjoy and it curates your experience. I am ready to get into this week's lesson. We are going to first Kings and we're going to be doing some jumping around. We'll be in chapter eight and we'll be looking at verses 22 through 24 37 through 39, 46, and then we'll jump from 48 to 50 A. Let's pray and then we'll read our passage together. Father, I thank you for another opportunity to be in community, to study your word. I thank you so much for your word that gives us life and it tells us how to live our lives as believers. Thank you that we're all being discipled through your word and being made better. And God, now I pray that you'll open up our minds, our hearts, our understanding to receive from you and not only to read the word uh, for the sake of the context of the word, but to understand what we are to do with this word, how we are to 
live, how we are to be, how we are to become reflections of you in the earth. I pray for every person who's present and all of those who will catch every single replay. We love you and we give you glory in Jesus name. Amen. Right. Let's go. Let's read first. Again, we're going to first Kings chapter eight and we'll begin at verse 22. And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above or on the earth beneath who keepest covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all their heart, who has kept with thy servant, David, my father, that thou promised him. Thou spakest also with thy mouth and has fulfilled it with thine hand as it is this day. Skipping down to verse 37. If there be in the land famine, if there be pestilence, blasting, mildew, locust, or if there be caterpillar, if their enemy besiege them in the land of their cities, whatsoever plague, whatsoever sickness there be, what prayer and supplication soever be made by any man or by all the people Israel, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart and spread forth his hands toward the house. Then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and do give every man according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest. For thou, even thou only, knowest the hearts of all, thy, all the children of men. We're skipping now to verse 46. If they sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not, and thou be angry with them and deliver them to the enemy so that they carry them away captives unto the land of the enemy far or near. And finally, we're skipping to verse 48. And so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies, which led them away captive and pray unto thee toward their land, which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city, which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for thy name. Then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven in thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause, and forgive thy people that have sinned against thee, and all their transgressions wherein they have transgressed against thee, and give them compassion before them who carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them. This is our reading for this week as we continue with our second lesson in this unit quarter, which is entitled Worship as a Response. And in our first unit, we are having discussions about examples in the Old Testament of people who are responding to God's revelation through worship. And I'm telling you, these lessons are, for me, they're challenging our response system. Uh, what does it look like when God shows up? What does it look like when God makes a promise? What does it look like when God performs? Our memory verse is going to be, we have a couple verses, 38 through 39a. And our lesson angel that we will be able to so summarize Solomon's prayer analyze the structure and movement of Solomon's prayer at the temple dedication and write a prayer to dedicate the congregation's meeting places to the Lord. So this week we are in first Kings and this is a book that's typically attributed to the prophet Jeremiah and the exact authorship is actually not known. So in your study and commentaries, you may have seen that it's even believed to be a compilation of different writers, but this book is a part of a historic narrative in the Old Testament, and it tells the story of Israel's monarchy. And it continues where Second Samuel actually leaves off. So it details the reign of Israel's kings that begin with Solomon and lead into the dividing of the kingdoms between the Northern and the Southern kingdoms. By the way, if you need the TSS notes for this lesson or the 20 questions, you can click the link in the description box down below and we should have a kid pack for this week's lesson as well if you're teaching this lesson to young people. So the purpose of First Kings is to document really the spiritual and political history of Israel's kings and it focuses on their faithfulness or in some cases, the lack of faithfulness of those leaders and what you typically saw in leadership you saw in the people. So when the kings were faithful, generally you saw more faithful behavior out of the people. But when 
um, God's people were unfaithful. They were specifically being unfaithful to the covenant with God. That covenant, remember, he was going to be their God. They were to be his people. And what the people were to supply in covenant was their obedience. And we talked about, if you missed last week's lesson, please go back and check out our lesson, which was from Genesis. And it talked about Moses. But remember, this has been all about God building and establishing relationship with people. So you'll be able to follow this idea of what covenants look like and what God required of his people. This is a reminder reminder of the importance of faithfulness to God, his commandments, and just how leadership can influence the spiritual health of a nation. I don't mean to take a political turn here, but even as we find ourselves inside of a political um, time in our nation, in a, in a space of considering our next leadership, we have got to remember that the spiritual health of the nation is influenced by the leader. So we should always be prayerful as we consider uh, our choices in leadership, even in our nation. The major themes in this book are going to be the sovereignty of God, covenant faithfulness, the role of prophets, and the rise and the decline of the kingdom. So let's take a look at our cast of characters. First, we have King Solomon. He is the king of Israel, and Solomon is the son of King David. And I thought about what must it be like to follow behind the leadership of King David? He definitely... Uh, followed an incredible leader, not a perfect man at all, but definitely a man after God's own heart. And so he at this point is the king of Israel, and he is now about to lead the nation in a significant moment of worship as he dedicates the temple to God. Next, we have the Assembly of Israel, and this is a large gathering of people that includes elders, tribal leaders, and representatives of the various families of Israel. And they've come together in Jerusalem for the dedication of the temple, and they witnessed Solomon's prayer before God. And then we have Yahweh, the Lord God himself, who is not physically visible, but he is the central presence in the event. He is the one to whom this prayer is dedicated, and Solomon is acknowledging God's faithfulness and his presence now dwelling in the temple. As we go into our printed text in verse 22, I think it's important just to consider a little bit more of the background. Again, we've got King Solomon who has successfully completed the construction of the temple in Jerusalem. And this is a task that his father really longed to complete. But scripture tells us in First Chronicles that David was not allowed to complete the temple because he was a man of bloodshed. He was a man of war. And although Solomon, we've already said it, was a, a man who was who had leadership marked by his wealth, his wisdom, his political alliances, um, even making Israel a significant power in the region, his greatest achievement was building this temple. And so it was going to serve as a central place of worship for the Israelites. And it was the place that would house the Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of the presence of God with his people. Now, the construction of the temple took a long time. It took seven years to build this. This was a grand project, a very opulent temple, and it had materials that were sourced from near and far. There was cedar from Lebanon and other precious stones. I give you details for that in the TSSG notes. But here's the thing about the temple. It was not just a physical structure. The temple represented so much more. It was God's presence among the people. It was the place where God dwelled with his people. And it was considered the earthly home of God's presence. It was the heart of worship, the place where they would go for their sacrifices, for prayer, to offer praises to God, and really kind of like this focal point of their spiritual and communal worship. It was about their spiritual and cultural identity. It was a physical presence that represented their relationship with God. And it was a symbol of God's promises to them as well, a place of unity and community. So after he finished the temple, he brings the Ark of the Covenant into the temple and places it in the innermost part of the temple, which is known as the most holy place. And at this moment, it was a huge event because the Ark representing the presence of God is here among his people. And as all these leaders are assembled and these families have brought the Ark up, the temple is 
filled with this incredible cloud. The sanctuary of the temple is filled with a cloud which symbolized the glory of God, just like it had done during Israel's journey through the wilderness. So an incredible moment that they have experienced. And now Solomon stands before the altar of the Lord in front of this entire assembly of people. If you're visual, you should imagine all of these people present. And he begins to offer this prayer of dedication. Again, it culminates. This is the icing on the cake of years of working and believing and laboring and sourcing material. And now we have this permanent place for the presence of God. And sort of looming in all of this, even though there's this amazing moment that's happening, this is Israel we're talking about. And their relationship with God has always been marked by cycles, cycles of faithfulness, cycles of rebellion and disobedience and having to be disciplined. And so even though we have this temple that represents the manifest presence of God and this culmination of promise to his people, kind of this looming tension. Like, is Israel going to be able to be faithful to God? Are they going to be able to do this now that they have this permanent place of worship? Or is Israel going to be Israel? And are they going to fall back into a place of complacency and idol worship? In verse 22, we have Solomon now before the altar of the Lord, and he's standing before this incredible congregation of people. He is about to offer this prayer of dedication where he's recognizing the faithfulness of God and covenant with his people. Look at how he opens in verses 22 through 24. I call this Solomon's supplication for sovereign support. And the first thing that I want you to know is Solomon does not begin his prayer with everything he needs God to do. He opens up his prayer by acknowledging that God has kept his promises that God is unlike anybody else. He is faithful and he has kept covenant with those who walk before him with all their hearts. What Solomon is specifically referring to is the promises that were made to his father, David. God has fulfilled his promise by allowing Solomon to build this temple. And he refers to covenant and the Hebrew word for covenant here signifies like steadfast love, mercy and kindness, which means this term goes way beyond like just a basic legal agreement. He is talking about God's enduring loyalty, his compassion for his people. And he recognizes that God's relationship with Israel is not just about a matter of law. Like God is deeply rooted in love and mercy. And you can see that in how he deals with his people. And Solomon then highlights that God has been reliable. We've been able to depend on you in fulfilling your promise. Like he mentions that what God speaks with his mouth, he has fulfilled it with his hand. In other words, what God says he's going to do, he does that. And it's not just this one time. He is acknowledging like, God's active role in their entire history. Every time you've made a promise, you've always done what you said that you would do. Every promise, you have always brought them to completion. And so again, it's a reminder for us that God's words are not empty. His words are followed up by action. And then he emphasizes the faithfulness of God. And he also like talks about the responsibility of people inside of that faithfulness that God and this covenant love that he gives toward those who walk before him with all their heart. In return, there's like this reciprocity. There is an importance that those people that God has shown this level of love and kindness to that they will in turn um, love God fully and that they will live a life that is aligned with the will of God in return. That's reciprocity in relationship. My pastor talks about it often that there is reciprocity that should happen. God is faithful. And so his people are called to be faithful back to him. And so I want to take a look at in every section, like what do we gain or what do I learn as a key learning? And the first thing I see is that like I can trust that God will always fulfill his promises to me. Just like he did for Israel, when God speaks something, I can trust that he will fulfill it. And like Israel, I can look back over my life and I can see moments like where God has kept his promises for me. Even when things seem uncertain, when there were circumstances that I didn't understand 
or I didn't have all the pieces to things that even may have felt hurtful in the time at the time. God has always kept his promises. So just like Solomon recognized God's faithfulness, I too, you too should recognize when God has been faithful in our lives. And, you know, we can reflect on his promises and how he has always brought those to fulfillment. It also makes me think about that covenant, again, that it is more than just a legal obligation, that he remains faithful even when I fall short. God is faithful even when you fall short. And it also teaches me that, you know, I can trust God. I can trust his promises. I can trust his process. When he speaks, he's going to act. And that gives me like confidence as a believer. I don't get to control the timing of God. But what I can know is that what he says he's going to do and his timing may not be my timing because the difference is he sees the full picture and I don't. You don't see the full picture. And so we are called to be like patient and not to wane in our faith and just to know that God will fulfill what he said he will do. It's also a call to like personal responsibility to walk before God with all of our hearts. And that is about like our response to his love. It's our response to his promise. And I say that every day that I wake up, You know, I renew my commitment to love God. And it's not like I have to be saved all over again. But when I say renew that commitment, I renew commitment in my choice to love him daily. I renew that commitment in every choice that I make. That's walking out life. So when I what I put on in the morning, I want to honor God. Where I go in the day, what I listen to, the community that I choose, the friends that I hang around, the music that I listen to, the books that I read. All of it reminds me that relationship with God, like it's not one sided. It is about commitment to live according to the will of God. Verses 37 through 39. This is seeking safety in seasons of struggle. And Solomon is praying that God will intervene in times of danger. And he talks about a lot of possible scenarios. And he's going to ask God to respond to the prayers of his people in the time of their struggle. He is, he said here that there are all kinds of calamities that could happen. He addresses things that might come up on the people of Israel. This includes famine, um, pestilence, invasion of their enemies, you know, nat- natural disasters. If these things happen, he's asking God to hear the prayers of the people, not just crying about their calamity. But when they turn to him in times of distress and to forgive their sins, he's really focusing on like the relationship between human suffering, repentance and divine forgiveness. So what he knows, he acknowledges like the reality that they might possibly face hardship. Israel might face famine. They might face plague. They might face enemy attacks because these were common in ancient in the ancient world. Um, And oftentimes it was seen as a form of punishment for the nation's sin. And I think we should think about the fact that nations can be under the judgment of God for their collective choices and their collective sin. And so Solomon is not naive about the people that he leads. As leaders, you got to know who you serve. And so he knows that even in times of prosperity, that trouble could come to them and it may be linked to the people's moral and spiritual condition. And so he's emphasizing that when these calamities occur, it ought to prompt the people. You know, people love to run to God. I even look at a calamity that's happened in our nation um, during the pandemic. You couldn't log on to social media without prayer meetings. They were a dime a dozen. But now that we're back in a space that we feel safe again, a lot of the prayer meetings and the uh, c- candid conversations that were taking place, apparently they don't. we don't have a need for those now because we're back into a place of comfort. And, and Solomon knew that, right? He knew that uh, people should be prompted to go to God, but he also knew that the propensity is just to go to God about the calamity. He says, nope, that's not what I'm praying for. It's not just about turning to God for help, but it's about acknowledging their role in what was going on, acknowledging their sin where they did not align with the will of God and seek God's forgiveness. And, you know, he's really showing us that national or personal crises may be opportunities for spiritual renewal. It doesn't always mean we've done something wrong, but we need to pay attention to that 
And when we look at what it means to repent, that Hebrew word is not just to go say, I'm sorry. It's not just, you know, Brown from, uh, you know, the Tyler Perry said, I'm sorry. It's not that. Repentance is like truly not only being sorry, but being willing to return or to change direction. So Solomon acknowledges that there are going to be moments of crisis and it may require that response to God with sincerity. So he's appealing to the nature, the character of God. He's appealing to his mercy. And he's saying, you know, would you hear from heaven and forgive the people when they repent with the right heart? When their hearts are repentant, he knows that God and God alone knows the heart of his people. And God is able to discern like when we're truly repentant and when we are not. So he he reflects on this repentance and he's asking God, let me just stop this, to look at the people and to respond to them when they have genuinely turned back to him with all of their Heart. Solomon also seems to have an awareness of the compassion of God as he prays. And he sees God as one who listens, but who also responds to human suffering. And so Solomon's appeal to God is really based on his ability to forgive and to restore and knowing that God's people's survival depends on the favor of God. As I looked at this section of scripture, here are my key learnings. First is when I face hardships, I should view them as an opportunity to take a look at my own spiritual condition. Is it an opportunity for me to turn back to God? And I know, you know, we think about, you know, big sins, smoking, drinking, and cussing, but sometimes there are things that God is trying to work out of us that are character in nature. Is he trying to work pride out of you through something that may be going on? And I think that there are opportunities for us to look at ourselves individually. Sometimes we have to look at ourselves as a collective, as a faith-based community. And most certainly there are times that we must look at ourselves as a nation and know that there are times that we must turn back to God when we must reassess the quality of our walk with God. And here's the thing about it. No matter what we have done, God is always willing to hear our prayer. No matter what I have done, no matter what you have done, there's nothing so terrible that God is not willing to hear your prayer. You've got to know that if you hear this lesson today and you're thinking, but I've done this and I've done that, there's nothing that you've done that God will not forgive. Here's the catch. When you come to him sincerely, he is looking at the sincerity of heart when we come to him. And again, I think there are these times that we have been guilty of, you know, either, you know, knowing what we were going to do that was wrong before we did it with a plan to pray when we got done. I did a lot of that as a young person. I did. But I think there are times that we are kind of flippant when we pray. You know, well, if there's anything that I did that displeased you, no, you know you did something. Come to God sincerely and know that there is power in repentance. Repentance is not a bad word. It's not a bad word. And it's not just feeling sorry for our actions. That's not what repentance is. Repentance is about genuinely changing direction. It is seeking God's forgiveness and then making the commitment to align your life, our actions with his will. And repentance is so powerful because it opens the door to healing and restoration in relationship with God. So, you know, I know my last key learning is that God, you know, he sees our hearts. He knows the condition of our hearts. He knows better than we do the condition of our hearts. So again, we can't hide behind words or appearances or church attendance. When there are things that we need to get right, we need to get in the face of God and in the space of God in deep sincerity. And God is the only one that can see that and that can truly judge that. So that really encourages me to be honest with God, not just in my words, but even in the condition of my heart. Verse 46. This is sin's strain and seeking salvation because Solomon is acknowledging it's inevitable. Sin is going to happen. It is going to happen. And here's the thing. Sin has consequences. The thing about sin is sin will, uh, it'll keep, take you further than you want it to go and keep you longer than you want it to stay. And, you know, sometimes people think that I'll just do a little bit of this or I'll do a little bit of that. You don't realize just how wide the chasm is as you allow that thing to continue to exist. And so in this prayer of dedication, Solomon is addressing 
the reality of sin. Again, he's a leader who knows these are people. And the reality is that sin will creep in with God's people. And he acknowledges that there is no one who doesn't sin. There is no one who has not sinned, not you, not me. There is no one. And so he's anticipating a scenario where the people of Israel might sin, but not just, you know, not a little thing. He is anticipating something grave, something that would allow God to even allow them to be defeated by their enemies, to be taken captive into foreign lands. And so Solomon is already pleading based on that anticipation. And he is asking for God's mercy. And he's asking God to hear their prayer uh, when they come to him repentant and to restore them. Again, fundamental truth, there's no one that doesn't sin. There's no one who hasn't sinned. Like this is the acknowledgement of us we're imperfect as humans. You know, that's just kind of the human condition. We are imperfect people. And Solomon knows that even God's chosen people, these are God's people. They're going to fall short and make mistakes. Even you with your church attending self, even me with all the things that I do, you know, at some point our human condition, we're going to fall short of something. And so this word here for sinners that Solomon uses is like one who misses the mark one who falls short of God's standard. And he's saying that when, you know, this collective has fallen short of the standard, he understands that sin might result in severe consequences. And so that could be even mean being defeated and captured by their enemies because of their unfaithfulness to God. And he understands that both individually and on the level of the nation, that when God's people turn away from them, they set themselves up for judgment and hardship. And so because of this inevitability of sin and its consequences, Solomon is asking God to hear them, to accept their repentance and to restore them. And again, I think it is beautiful when we think about like the willingness of God to hear us. And I know we, we talked about this in the last section of scripture, but I think so many people need to know that, that no matter how you may have fallen, God is still willing to listen to you. He's willing to listen if your prayers are genuinely repented. So even if they are so far, and in this case, what Solomon is setting up is when they're in a foreign land, sometimes we feel far away from God. We can feel that way. He is not talking about people who would, might just feel that way, but he's talking about even if they are literally far away from Jerusalem, if they are far away from this temple, if they get far away from this building, if they are in a place where they're having to sit with their consequences and remember what they had, he knows that God's ears will be open to his people and that God would be ready to forgive them and to restore them when they did this in a way that was sincere. Verses 48 through 50, this is that sincere surrender and sovereign salvation. And Solomon is calling for complete repentance, asking God to hear the heartfelt prayers of his people in exile and restore them to their land and to himself. He's focusing still on this idea of repentance and restoration. If they find themselves in captivity, he's pleading with God, hear their prayers. When they repent, even when they're in the foreign land, hear their prayers when they do this with all their heart, all their soul. And he mentions that the people, even in exile, they'll direct their prayers toward their homeland, toward the city of Jerusalem and the temple. They're gonna remember this temple where God's name has been, where it's been built for God's name to be placed there forever. And this act of physically turning is symbolic of like turn when they turn their backs on God, yet there's gonna be this connection. There'd always be this connection and this ability to turn back to God and again, God's nature, his character, God is loving. God is forgiving. He's not a punitive God. He's not sitting around waiting on us to fall and mess up so he can say, oh, gotcha. Let me see what punishment I can give them now. No, he wants, he doesn't like to give judgment to us. He, he's got to discipline us, but that's not what he wants. God wants relationship with his people. And so Solomon's plea is that God's mercy is not limited by geographical boundaries, and it would extend even to his people in exile. He's not just asking for a spiritual forgiveness, but complete restoration. 
that when they were exiled, that God would give them restoration. They'd be able to return to their homeland, that they would be made whole again. And when I thought about that, it really tells me about like the holistic nature of God's redemption, his ability to redeem. It's not just the interchange that he makes, but he's able to restore relationships. He's able to restore communities. He's able to restore nations. What we can know from this is that we need to turn to God with our whole hearts, like partial repentance, not good enough. God desires all of me. God desires all of you. And so I hope that you're challenged to reflect on the quality of your walk with God. Have you turned your back on God at all in any way? Is there anything that you're holding back from God? Is there an area that, you know, you might need to repent? Just know that God hears us no matter how far we may feel from him. God hears us. He hears us with an intent to act on our behalf. And so whether we feel, you know, we're not in literal exile like the Israelites would ultimately be. But if you feel distant physically, if you feel distant emotionally, even if you feel in spiritual exile, God's ears are open to your prayer. And I love that. That's the lesson for this week. If I were to summarize this prayer, there are really five points to the prayer. He's gets God's attention. Um, you know, it's a place where God's name is going to dwell forever. He talks about, he prays about forgiveness of sins, response to nation's crises, crises, uh, unity and integrity, and the witness that they would be to the nations in verses 41 through 43, which are not our printed text. You know, Solomon's hope is that the temple will be a witness to other nations. He wants everyone to see that Israel's God is powerful and the temple is a place where people can experience his presence and his blessings. My word of the week is prayer. You can read all about that in my TSSG notes. I also created, um, in each lesson, I think I've decided that I want to engage with it. And I do that every year. Like, how do I want to settle in with these lessons? We're still inside of a new Sunday school year. And I just, I'm kind of getting a feel for how I want to engage with this. And so what I've done so far is kind of looked for a kind of a best practice that I can adopt out of the lesson. So I've created a routine for prayer, a routine for repentance and restoration inside of the TSSG notes. But the lesson aim gave us a challenge of a prayer of dedication for our meeting place. And so I'm going to read you the prayer that I wrote and you can find everything else in your TSSG notes. God, today we come before you with grateful hearts, ready to dedicate this place to you. We acknowledge that this space is more than just walls and a roof. It's where we come together to worship, learn, and to grow our faith. Lord, we ask that you bless this place and fill it with your presence. May it be a sanctuary where we can experience your peace, joy, and guidance. Let this be a place where every person who walks through these doors feels your love and finds a sense of belonging. And as we gather here for worship, fellowship, and learning, we pray that this place becomes a reflection of your goodness and grace. Help us to use it wisely with our hearts open to serving others and honoring you in all that we do. May this space be a beacon of hope and a place where your name is glorified forever. Guide us as we come together and let your will be done in every meeting, every conversation, every act of service that happens here. We dedicate this space to you, Lord, trusting you will lead us, bless us and use us for your purpose. Thank you for being with us in this journey. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. I do pray that this lesson has blessed you in some way. Please leave a comment. Uh, just say hello or give me something out of your notes and I'll add them to my notes. All 13 pages of my notes, I'll add them to my notes and I'll be looking forward to sharing this lesson um, in my space, um, in my faith space on Sunday at the Dominion Word Ministries Church. So I love you all so much. I'll see you in Sunday school. Bye everybody. Thank you so much for studying with me this week. I want to remind you of my ask, please, that you support me with the gift of $9. And if you've never done so before, tip over to my Etsy store. If you're looking for great gifts for Sunday school students or maybe a student who wants to celebrate your teacher, superintendent who wants gifts, go and check out the Etsy store. There are t-shirts, tote bags, candles, pouches, you name it, all celebrating Sunday school. So there are at least eight different designs for both Sunday school and church school. So check them out. And if you've not already done so, check out my book on Amazon. So many
many of you have ordered it and I've got incredible feedback and I appreciate you so much. I'm excited about this devotional, which says it's for Sunday school teachers, but honestly, it works for anyone serving in any space, ministry or even corporate spaces. So if you're looking for a devotional to encourage you along your way, check it out. Love you and see you all soon. Sunday school with that Sunday school.